And then taking a cue from the organic cities in India, we said let's go a step further and twist this courtyard even more. So make it even more interesting. You don't pick up the element directly and use it directly in the same way that it was so many years ago. You imbibe that and you use it in your own way. You kind of abstract it. Arcades, once again, an example of Indian architecture which has been prevalent through palaces, through old houses. Please put your hands together and welcome with a thunderous, roaring, energetic round of applause, architect Sanjay Puri on stage. So I'll quickly take you through some projects that have been derived from Indian architecture but in a completely different way. So Indian architecture has so many examples, so many examples of good sustainable architecture before the word sustainable was known. And these are prevalent in all the old cities, in all the old architecture that are still existing, which have been built with very low energy and are extremely energy efficient. And most importantly, they are contextual to the climate in India. Step wells are one of those examples that all of us know. Amazing community spaces as well as storing water for entire townships. Courtyards, which have been there in, from the smallest house of 2,000 square feet or 1,500 square feet to large palace spaces. The courtyard that facilitates natural ventilation and brings in natural sunlight at the same time creates shaded spaces all throughout. So courtyards in Indian architecture have been used in so many different ways, as you can see here, fostering number of activities from complete family get-togethers to bringing in friends together and providing a sheltered space for numerous activities. Arcades, once again, an example of Indian architecture which has been prevalent through palaces, through old houses. Many of them still exist. If you go to Rambagh Palace, for example, in Jaipur, even today, on the hottest day when it's 45 degrees outside, you can still walk in those corridors and still feel cool. So these are examples of architecture that have been there since the last 200 years in India, which offer so many different ways of doing things. And then Jali screens, which have been constructed earlier in stone, which right from Hawa Mahal to so many other palaces and private homes, provide sheltered light, reduce the heat gain, and provide privacy at the same time. But the idea is that you don't pick up the element directly and use it directly in the same way that it was so many years ago. You imbibe that and you use it in your own way. You kind of abstract it. So this is a project that we just finished a few months ago in Jaipur. It's a house of 27,000 square feet. On the left, was the existing house. It's a long, deep plot. And the clan's family had grown big, so they wanted a new house built in the northeast corner. And there's a large garden space inside, and there were a lot of trees. And those trees which you see are actually the trees that have been there since the last 20 years since this house was built. So keeping all the trees as they were, the new house was constructed in the extreme corner. and. What happens here is, you look at the section simultaneously, there is a whole open courtyard introduced from which you look out at the garden at the back and then there's a whole strip of green created on the west and the northern side and then the courtyard itself within the house is sunken. So it's a different feeling with one side three levels high and one side uh, two levels up from the ground and one subterranean. So these are the floor plans. You enter from the east side, and then there's open circulation around the central courtyard space, and then all the rooms are on the perimeter, and each room has this private open space which is sheltered, looking out towards all these existing trees. And again here, I mean, we have just been through, uh, the clients have been living here since the last 12 months now, and their feedback is that in this house, on the hottest day in Jaipur, which is beyond 40 degrees, you can still sit out in the veranda at any time of the day, just simply because of the way it's oriented and the way it is sheltered. That's the upper floor plan. 
So the lower floor plan had three bedrooms, the upper floor plan has three bedrooms, it's a house for two families and then there's a lounge space on the topmost floor opening into a large north facing terrace. And then the subterranean space which is like more of a party room which can be used in multi-purpose ways and opens up into this courtyard which finally looks out at the garden beyond which is existing. So these are cross sections through the house showing how different spaces have different openings which are sheltered. We will get a better idea looking at the house. So when you walk into the house, that's the first view from the road, purposely done in this way because it's an arterial road in Jaipur where there's a lot of traffic. So it's been purposely screened so that the screens give privacy to the house. At the same time, they reduce the heat gain from the eastern side and they reduce the noise which is transmitted into the house. We've done a very interesting section where the staircase from the ground to first goes up on the left hand side. If I just go back. So towards the left hand side the staircase goes up two levels on the left hand side and then the cantilevered portion actually houses the staircase from the first to the second floor automatically forming a protected entrance space. So this is the house from the northeast corner where you can see that uh, the sheltered space is so well sheltered that it's completely in shadow. And these are the spill out spaces for the living room and the lounge and the dining spaces. So that's the main entrance. And you walk into the house and this is the south side. So as I mentioned before, there was a complete line of trees and we took care not to cut any tree. The house dimensions were literally governed by the existing trees on the side. So we drew, put, plotted all those trees then found the exact maximum space that you can build within and then within that we created all these courtyards and open spaces. So the trees literally hug the house on every side. That's a close up of the entrance. And this is the sunken courtyard which you look at from the southern side. It's completely sheltered and all the circulation spaces that you see are skirting this courtyard. So whenever you walk through this house, you are constantly being able to look out towards the landscape spaces. And then within all these screened sheltered spaces, there are portions that are open. So you can choose from your room whether you want to sit behind the screen and have a private moment or you want to sit out in the open and be able to be seen as well. These are the spill out spaces from the living room, from the dining room, from the lounge space in the middle with a sunken seating at the bottom at the lower level and then a terrace space at the upper level. And these are the sheltered spaces on the western side where each room opens into these private sheltered spaces. So you have spaces which are used as community spaces within the house and at the same time every room has its own individual space. So this is the same space looking backwards. And then these are those kind of balcony spaces. You can see how close the trees are to the house. So they're literally hugging the trees all around. That's another balcony space. So every room has these balconies and open spaces. And that's uh, sunken seating looking out towards the north with seating spaces on either side of the living dining areas. That's the house from the outside where the staircase is a cantilevered one spiraling up with the same detail as the exterior. And this is when you just enter the house, the first view. So the staircase is purposely done right at the entrance so that because there are two families, one can go up straight from the entrance itself and then one moves up the spiral going up. That's me. And this is the first view when you walk in. So you see the amount of openness that is created, the degrees of openness that are there prevalent through the house in the following slides. So you walk in and you look out at the courtyard immediately. And then you're walking within the house and you have the sunken courtyard on the side. You have this sheltered veranda space which is looking out towards it. And at the opposite end you can see the living room opening up towards the north. And this is the central space within the house which we call the summer court because during the summers the, wind, the sun is on the other side. So it is nice to sit in the sun. And the opposite side has similarly a winter court. So these are all the circulation spaces within the house. 
It's all very light and very simple, that's the puja space within the house. And that's uh, the living room and a bedroom. So all of these spaces add landscape spaces beyond. It's a freestanding bed ahead of this. Every space has its own interesting shadow and light and pattern created throughout. So this is the lower area courtyard as one moves out and you see the garden above which extends up to the existing house that was already there. And this is the lounge space at the lower level. And then here we went beyond in terms of detailing and we created all the tables specifically for this house. And that's the pet dog of the owner. So very interesting views all throughout the house. The second house is uh, Mirai, House of Arches, which is built on a plot which is less than half the size of the Jaipur one. It's a very small plot in Bhilwara, which is a two-hour drive from Udaipur city in Rajasthan, and again, very, very hot. So this is the site. It's within a housing project of 140 bungalows, and this is a corner site. Here, the whole idea was that how do you build in Bilwala using materials that come from within a small radius so that you don't have to go out for anything. So literally 90% of the materials used in this house have come from within the region and within a 100 kilometer radius. All these are Vedic bricks. The contract laborers were all from the vicinity. Some of them did not know this kind of construction and were trained on site before they started to work. So these are the basic bricks with which the entire house has been built. Contrary to what a lot of people think, uh, a lot of people think that these curved walls were created in RCC. They are not in RCC. They are in these Vedic bricks. We made very simple arches with literally two bars of reinforcement and a small metal plate. And the arches were cast as lintels, very thin over which all these bricks were supported. So there's actually no straight line within this house on the exterior. Lime plaster, which is a technique which is being forgotten, is being revived and this is a very good material and all of you should be using it instead of cement plaster. It has a lot of benefits. A, there's less cement production. B, lime reduces the temperature by 5 to 7%. So this is the house within the plot. It's a 9,000 square feet house because that was the client's requirements. Three levels and a plot of only 600 square meters. So when you draw the footprint of this house within this, considering that you're going to make it three levels, yet it looks like there's literally no open space and it's just like this little perimeter that are left all around. So our first thing was in response to the temperature, when you look at what I spoke to you earlier about is the arcades and what they do in terms of reducing the heat gain into buildings. This is exactly what has been done here, but in a completely different way. So rather than creating stone carved arcades, this is an envelope that literally curves around the building, creating all these shelter spaces for each room to walk out, out of. So you have a shelter space outside and at the same time, you reduce the heat gain into the inside. Again, this house, in the hottest day, you can walk into this house and there is no need for an AC to be put on in any of the rooms. Now, the perimeter is really small. So we literally had, after building in the client's requirements, the footprint leaves 4.5 meters only, which is the width of the stage all around the house. So, but there was a large footpath where people in the other plots within the complex have been parking their cars. So here we convinced the client that you take that whole pathway inside. So at least you will have that much greenery. You don't park anything there, but don't build a compound wall. So the 4.5 may game nine meters and you can see how it is. So there is at least that much garden all around the house. So these are the floor plans. Very, very simple because, like I said, it's a reasonably tight plot. 
you walk into a corridor and it's open on the outside, right opposite, with three different heights within this tiny compact square. So the living room is one and a half floors high, the dining space is two floors high, and the rest of the rooms are a single level high. So one won't expect that within a plinth of 250 square meters, you have three different heights playing with each other. So those are the floor plans as you go up, with terraces being created at every single level. And these are cross sections which show the different heights through the house. So here you see the dining space, which is two floors high. Then there is a split space above the living room. And each of these curves is actually connecting a higher point to a lower point, curving in plan at the same time, curving across the third dimension at the same time. And that is how you get this interesting abstraction of spaces that have been created contextually to the climate. So this is the house from the road corner. And that's when you walk in and you see this uh, small water body created and you look out, small lounge space on the right, the staircase going up through the center. And these are the interspecial spaces created all throughout the perimeter of the house. So every room walks out into this house, into these spaces which are sheltered and then finally look out towards the garden. The terrace on the top level as seen from outside. but I think that's too long to read. So, but in short, what they've said is they've spent uh, the last 18 months living here and said it's beautiful that you have spaces that you can walk out to everywhere. So we have places where we collect and at the same time, every room has its own individual space so we feel like going into our shell or for some private moments. We can do that also in this house and it's really nice to experience this. So that's the snapshot of what the family had to say about the project. This one is an office building, which is actually an industrial office in a remote location outside of Raipur. So Raipur in Chhattisgarh, but that's, it's not technically Raipur, it's 150 kilometers from Raipur. So that's the site. 
there is nothing around this side. It's a large cement plant who is our client and it is for them that this building was made towards the mouth of the entrance uh, to the entire cement plant. So this is the site that we were given. It's a very small built up area when you compare it to the amount of land that is available. So the percentage was very small. So we looked at obviously creating something that is low rise, ground plus one, and the resultant square becomes 63 by 63 meters, and that would have accommodated all the client's requirements within a square of that size compact, ground plus one. But then why would you do a square where you have light penetration only for eight to nine meters? So Again, going back to the courtyard, we expanded this, made a courtyard and said, let's look at it with a courtyard so that you have more light penetration. At the same time, the footprint kind of increases visually from the outside, but every portion of the office will then get natural light. But then what happens in all these courtyards in India, the way we've seen it over old schools, palaces, whatever, I, if, if, if this was a courtyard and you were in this corner, you were that corner, that corner, that corner, it kind of looks the same. So how do you get a courtyard to look very interesting from each part? So I mean, you should feel that I'm on this side and outside this room, and that's why the courtyard is looking different to me. And it should be a different experience from the other side, and so on. So we first angled this out, went parallel to the site, and made a trapezoid. At the same time, what happens is the north face becomes longer, which is better for light, since the sun is always in the southern direction here. And then taking a cue from the organic cities in India, we said, let's go a step further and twist this courtyard even more. So make it even more interesting. And what happens is when you do a very large square, you have a huge amount of light in the middle. So it's the purpose is actually defeated. If it's a small courtyard, it is far more intimate. At the same time, a lot of shadows and you can actually use that space. So this is what this does. And it, it narrows the courtyard in parts, widens it in slight parts so that there is shadow at all times of the day and these courtyards are usable all throughout the day. And then further what we did is we lifted up some of these corners so that you get natural wind coming in through the entire courtyard space. So you get these different perspectives from wherever you are within this building. And then to facilitate a nice airflow, the building itself is lifted up on the north corner as well as on the northeast and northwest corners. And then in addition, we provided uh, steel louvers which are inclined so that, again, they are inclined towards the north, so you get natural light only from the north side. So the heat gain from the south is completely reduced. Effectively, this building needs 35% less air conditioning with all these factors. So that's the ground floor plan, and that's the first level plan. These are cross sections which show how the volumes keep changing throughout wherever you go within this building. And depending upon where you are moving to this building, you'll always get a different perspective. And rather than most buildings which have some kind of entrance canopy or something which, which, which kind of tells you that you've arrived and you get off here, the building here just lifts up and allows you to go inside. And what it also does is it connects the outside landscape to the inner landscape space. So it's an interesting new way to enter a building. So that's the detail of the entrance. And this is the building lifting up on the corner, creating a gym space on one side, which is single height. And then on the other side, it creates a cafeteria, which is two floors high. So now, because of the way it is shaped, because of the way the courtyard is shaped, you experience the building differently from within the building. You experience it differently from outside, wherever you are. So that's a close-up of the cafeteria side. The cantilever is more than 16 meters, which is not allowed now in, under the rules in Bombay, Delhi, etc. I don't know why. If a structural consultant can prove that he's designed according to norms and the building is safe, I don't know why you would put a cap on the amount you can cantilever. So that's the building again from the other side. So every side, it looks a little different. And here you can see the cement plant towards the rear and the building towards the entrance of the entire land. This is the landscape space. And the other landscape is kept very, very simple because we had to have something which is low maintenance. And this is the building from the outside where you can see the courtyard and the way it is shaped within the building. And a close-up of that courtyard. 
and further views. And this is when you are within the courtyard. So you can see that there is the whole right side right now is under shadow. At the same time, the extreme left you can see is also under shadow. And these shadows keep changing. So this is what I meant with if you make a courtyard too large, you're going to have too much sun in the middle anyway. So the shadowed area is very low. But here, because of the intimacy, because of the turning, because of the angles, you have shadow in every part, in different parts at all times of the day. So it's all usable. So that's the cafe space from the inside, looking out towards the water body. And the corridors, we skirt the corridor. These are the labs which are within. So there are research labs and cement production and testing labs within the building. So the louvers, as I mentioned earlier, are all turned so that you have only light coming in from the northern side. All of it was built in fly ash bricks, which is a byproduct of the cement plant. I know cement production in itself, I mean cement in itself is not something that is sustainable, but here our client was a cement plant. So we try to do it as sustainably as possible with the fly ash bricks. The building uses all the residual energy of the cement plant, so there is not a single, uh, what's it called, watt of power being used by the building which is generated. It all comes from the residual energy. Cross ventilation is facilitated, the longest side is towards the north, so you have most of the building with natural light from the northern side and it's all indirect. And all the roof water is recycled and reused. And these are the passive cooling water bodies towards the northern side. So these are the kind of buildings that they were making. They didn't understand why we were taking so much time when we initially took time to create the design because the top views are the views of the kind of buildings that they made in their other cement plants. So he said, we'll make a building that will not cost you too much more, just a little bit more, but let it be more energy efficient and more interesting for the people to use. So the building is low rise, derives the courtyard, but it kind of completely transforms the way the traditional courtyard is perceived, giving a different direction altogether to how it is and contextual to the climate totally. Which brings us, oops, I am running out of time. So this is the courtyard school, which we are now constructing in Kodla, which is again a very remote area in Karnatak. That's the site. It is part of a 36-acre residential complex situated at the entry so that it facilitates education not just for the workers of the cement plant but also for the nearby villages. Of course, you can see no nearby villages in this, so the nearest village is about 8 kilometers away. And that's the site as it is now. So some of the buildings are already constructed and the school has started construction. So this, the master plan was also done by us where there's a large playground already planned on the southern side and the school has just started construction. So these are the way education is being taught in uh, the villages which are close by. And these are the kind of schools that are there. We actually did this whole study. There's such bad condition that's unbelievable. You have furniture which is in bad shape. It's not even painted. Boards which are falling off. People are sitting like this. I mean, there are places where people are actually studying like this. This is the case of education. So here, in India, we, as you all know, we have requirements by the education ministry when you have to plan a school. So you have a minimum. When you want to register a school, you have to have 12 classrooms, two laboratories, and one library. But then, when you are catering to these kind of people, and this is, we looked at it as not just a school for the workers, but also you provide education for everybody who's around because the condition was so poor. So we went and asked these people that what is it that you want and we came up with these additional requirements that they needed a cooking class, crafts class, play spaces, open areas to study because they are actually not used to studying in closed spaces. So our whole school is derived from that concept. Everything is very organic, free-flowing, so that there is less of the sense of a formal school and more natural spaces everywhere. So this is the entire school where we provided a large series of steps going up to the first floor from the outside itself with accessible terraces so that even if the school is closed, you can still use these spaces irrespective. So this is the way the facilities have been planned with the classrooms on the north side and the east side and the other facilities like the auditorium towards the southwest, admin areas on the northwest. So this is a detailed plan. 
where there are courtyards between each one of these classrooms. So not only are the classrooms towards the north, but they have zero light coming in from the exterior. All light is borrowed light from these tradition, from the courtyards. So it's indirect into two times. And then this is the way, uh, you know, the detail is done where the classrooms are actually getting light from the east and west, but from the northern side from a sheltered courtyard. So you have completely minimized heat gain because we don't want to air condition the school. The school should be responsive to the climate and be usable even though in Kodla, in this area, the temperatures are in excess of 35 degrees for nine months of the year. So these are cross sections of the school. I'm sorry, I'm going a little fast because time is running out. That's the way the school will be seen from the outside, from the entrance. You walk in first and you see this large open courtyard it's been designed to facilitate the exact number of students that are going to occupy this school, so that if you have to have any kind of interaction with all the students together, you can do it here. And then there are these series of courtyards all around as well, with open terraces at the first floor from which you can look out at the sports. Again, here we're doing everything in a sustainable way using Vedic bricks, recessed windows, open courtyards, natural ventilation. This is a material I don't know how many of you know. This is a floor made out of lime tiles, which literally, if the temperature, and I'm, this I've studied and uh, actually used it. So the guy challenged me. I said, uh, it's not possible. He said, this floor remains cool in the hottest day. He said, you take off your shoes and walk on it now. And I did it. It was 35 degrees outside and it is cool on the feet in 35 degrees. This is something that all of us should be using instead of using any kind of tiles, china mosaic and whatever else you use on terrace tops. It's a huge cooling difference. So this is the way the activities have been mapped in the school. Because there are so many informal spaces, we've given spaces for all the additional facilities that the villagers came back to us with. Last one. This is an office building that we're building in Congo, in the Republic of Congo, in Africa. So it's a small site with a very irregular shape and we went first time and did a study on what buildings there are and these are the kind of buildings that exist in the business district of Kinshasa. What these glass buildings do is everybody knows. This is... Uh, this Pullman Hotel is like literally two plots away from the building where you're building, making this building. Complete glass. So because there's so much heat coming in, then people put blinds, then you put the blinds and you need the artificial lights on and so on. So it's all energy guzzler buildings being created. So that's our site. These 15-story buildings are already under construction and therefore we decided that you plan the service core towards the side of the residential buildings. So you have complete, you avoid overlooking totally towards the residential side. At the same time, the shortest views to the river Congo are on the northern side. And the sun is always in the southern hemisphere. So all the offices get indirect northern light. So that's uh, the office building. The lower floors are all parking so that right from the first level of the offices, you get clear views of the river in the distance. And these are the sun path diagram. The sun throughout the year is in the southern hemisphere, just slight angle variations. So this is the way it was conceived. So it's not just looks out in the north, but then there are these projected terrace spaces from every office. And you have gardens created there so that there is cooling, there is more garden space. The built up area I forgot to mention it because the slides went very fast, is 14 times the plot area. Here in India, we are struggling with 2 FSI and 3 FSI at the max 3.5. is 14 times. So in these 14 times, if we do the percentage of landscape space that is created in the building, it is more than the plot area by virtue of creating these terrace spaces. And at the same time, these terrace spaces, so the plan is not static. Every floor has a different plan not just in section, but in, uh, in the plan itself. So you have single height volumes, double height volumes playing with each other across. And these are the way the floor plans work, the parking floors, the office floors, and the terrace garden on the top, three basements. And this is the spatial daylight autonomy study, which shows that 
literally the whole building is getting natural light throughout the day. This is a section of the building. And this is the way in the long interior section you can see there are duplex offices and single level offices. And that's the way the building will look once it's complete with this very interesting array of balcony spaces from every office looking out towards the Congo River. Very quickly, just to finish, uh, this is uh, the Noka Garden Library that we are doing uh, in a village, remote village called Noka in Rajasthan, where it's an open courtyard facing the north, and it's a small library being created for the children in the school. The building is almost finished, and that's the finished photograph. And this is a house where uh, this is the maximum tradition that we've done so far, where the client actually came to us and asked for something that was a duplicate of the Umed Bhavan in Jodhpur. And it took us six months to convince him that you don't need to do domes and let's keep it a contemporary rendition of Indian traditional architecture. So the house has multiple courtyards and jali screens, all built in stone. These are real photographs. The solid stone walls, solid stone pergolas, all locally sourced. And uh, that's the atrium space, which is naturally lit from the top. This is the building just finished. And this is a new village that we're doing for the girl children of six villages in that Rajasthan area, which has no access to education right now. So here again, the building is designed with sheltered, deep recessed windows, a lot of terraces spaces that are open. The building follows the contours of the land, steps up along with the land. And that last one is the Prestige University, which uh, this was how it was envisaged. And that is the building with all the natural courtyards interspersed within the building. So just very quickly, rather than doing one central courtyard, there are about 22 different kinds of courtyards of different dimensions and different heights throughout this entire building, which get natural light into all the classrooms, admin areas, library in this university building. It's almost done now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.